face a very fast-paced business climate. The waves of change, which are the, the theme of this conference, are coming at us ever faster. And they're requiring CEOs to take action to correct uh, for performance or change course. The sort of things which can happen are corrections that might include right-sizing the company, correcting for a rapid switch in profitability, developing more agility and bringing product to market, trying to correct a portfolio after years of haphazard growth, or um, restructuring a company to, re to release the potential of its people. We're particularly lucky today that we're going to hear from four CEOs who have uh, very successfully implemented change throughout their careers. And we're going to hear different strands and different opinions on how to do it. It's a great learning experience, and I think the next three hours will be extremely worthwhile. It's a textbook of how to think about problems and how to fix them. We're going to start off uh, by inviting Mr. Mutlak al Morishet, the CEO of Tasni, to the stand. Uh, Tasni is the, one of the largest Saudi diversified industrial companies. Mr. Morishet is a great friend of this conference. I think you spoke at the very first one. And um, he also has a resume, which you'll find in your books, but includes um, directorships, uh, chairmanships, presidencies of all the great companies in this region. Uh, please welcome Mr. Morishet. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. I have to be careful today, I have my chairman here, so I'm gonna tone down. So uh, just a joke, no, I will speak my mind as usual, I appreciate all the present here of everybody. Uh, what I would like to do is really go over an article. Uh, uh, this is basically, was an article we wrote for, I wrote for uh, ISIS. It's not the ISIS in the Middle East, it's the ISIS in America. <laughs> it's the chemical magazine. And apparently the article was so much liked that uh, GBCA uh, asked me to make it in a presentation. So uh, that's what I did. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing actually was straight to the forming the GBCA as part of SABIC. I was actually involved in the first. So it's no wonder I was a speaker in the first session because at that time we didn't have hardly any speakers. <laughs> so it's great to see the, the present here today. So let me first say of all, uh, Restructuring a company has never been an easy or a pleasant task. Uh, I hear some of people around, especially unfortunately in our part of the world, always say, we're going to cut costs, we're going to improve efficiency, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And at the end they say, we will not lay off employees. Well, please, if anybody in this room can tell me how to cut costs, improve productivity, and do this without laying off employees, please tell me. I'd like to hear it. Because we have to be realistic. Restructuring businesses is going to involve some headcount reduction. And from experience of four in my life in the last 25 years, I can also assure you anything less than 20% or so is not worth the pain. The exercise is so painful. If people tell you they can do these things and go home asleep like a baby, I think they're lying. Because when you go through exercise like that, ladies and gentlemen, you, have, you will have a lot of sleep this night. And my wife was complaining. She said, you were busy in Saab, we didn't see you traveling. Now I'm tired of you in bed and not sleeping. She was better when you were in Saab traveling. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so let me go on. Basically, what, what we're going to talk about here is it's going to involve, of course, a head reduction is not the name of the game. There is a lot of improvement in the efficiency from working capital, from uh, supply chain, from everything. But it is an ugly subject, especially in this part of the world. And people always ask you the negative things. I was once in a uh, TV program and asked me the guy aggressive and said, well, you cut 30% of the workforce. I said, I will not apologize for that. Yes, but judge me on saving 70% of the workforce. So we should not look at the glass half empty. We should look at it half full. And that's the way we should look at these things. If you were in America or in Europe or anything, companies go through restructuring, their actually share price goes up, not down. 
So we need to learn some of these things. So let me tell you why companies go restructuring. A lot of companies go because of similar to these graphs. You have your revenue going down, you have your EBITDA going down, and you have basically sales going down. It goes down significantly. So some action needs to be taken. You cannot sit and watch your EBITDA going down from high of 39 to 12, and you pretend business as usual. That's just not possible. Either the market is going to punish you for that if you're public traded, or sooner or later, you're going to be out of the game. So you have really to think what you need to do. Of course, some luckier companies, some maybe leadership and other corporations, they do restructuring continuously. So they don't reach into that, but that's the exception. The majority of us humans are just like that, unfortunately, but that's the way it goes. So let me go. I'm going to first cover about seven things, from establishing the right plan all the way down to dealing with the employees and whatever in between. So let me give you just a quick on these things. First one, really, you have to follow the money. Any accountant in the room, if you do an audit, any accountant will tell you, follow the trail of money. Money will always lead you to what is happening. So in a restructuring, you need to follow where the business, the cost, the things. You need to set a PMO office, what's project management office. It's small and be staffed by good people. And please, we were asked a few months ago in another program, another consulting conference, the question of should be, this office should be embedded in the organization is totally separate. I can tell you, the people who will say embedded in the organization are the people who never done a restructuring. This should be totally separate because organization is like a gel. They shake and they absorb what caused them to shake. So never put things inside the organization. This should be independent and mostly stuff actually mostly by outsiders because you need to take that emotional touch between the organization and this office. So that is very important. And basically, you need to measure. You know, if you don't measure it, you will not achieve it. You need to do it. When I show you later, I think some of the people here, when you go to the L0 to the L5, basically from the idea to the execution and to the realization. What the realization means is you find a lot of people saying, we did this and we saved this. And I say, great. But where is the beef? In Arabic, we say, when is zibda? A beef is in a line called net income. If that stuff doesn't flow into net income as either by extra net income or reducing the pain on net income, I have people like Fawaz, which a lot of the accounting people in Saudi, the auditors and know Fawaz, when it comes to these things, is Hanbali. Nothing passed the balance sheet with him. So I make sure that the PMO said we did these things for what signs on it. He signs on that one. The CFO signs. And that is very important for any CEO or any leadership going through restructuring. You need to make sure the money is in the bank. If the money is, in the, is not in the bank, you're kidding yourself with all due respect. You're just kidding yourself. So the next is you look at working capital. Working capital is a hidden jewel in organizations. Companies have huge money, either sitting in the tank, sitting in the storage, sitting in the warehouse as MROs, basically spare parts, sitting in your account receivable, that your people let your money sit with customer for weeks and months without taking. Last the year I left Sabic, I started a program of uh, two, uh, two billion Saudi Riyal. When I left, it was achieved 1.8. And I think some Sabic people here in the room probably testify what it was closed at. I left before it was closed. But you can imagine, 1.8 billion sitting. And Sabic measured that by cash flow at that time. You look at Sabic cash flow, you see this and after this. No joke, no, no gimmicks. It's real money in the bank. So that's very important. The other things is make sure there is accountability. In a 
what we call a holding model. If this is a holding model, uh, this is a holding model structure, the holding company. Plenty of little companies all over the place, and then accountability gets lost because it doesn't go all the way to the top. It just becomes collecting papers and numbers from different companies and then publishing it together. So the accountability is not there. You need to change to more of the kind of the operational model where you have corporate core, CEO, CFO, strategy, and TNI. You need to call SBUs, whatever businesses you have. In our case, we have basically three, titanium dioxide, titanium, petrochemical, and downstream. And then you have shared services. Shared service, basically, you take all the back office operation, hundreds, thousands of people here. You put it in one organization. You serve all these SBUs from shared services, and you save a huge amount of headcount. So that is, that is very important for the organization. So accountability is the most important thing in our restructuring. I have just go through just a few experiences. Tasnia, I'm going to give you the numbers because I feel responsible for it. Tasnia, we went around 24, 25% reduction, headcount. Sabic IP done in 2009 was included portfolio on some plant closure. Some people didn't like it, but I actually did close plants in Scotland, in Australia, and other places, and took right off on it. Uh, that was also double-digit headcount reduction. Another headcount reduction was done in Sabic Europe, which was double-digit also, and includes some minor uh, plant shutdowns. And Hadid was huge, significant people don't remember, except maybe some people in Hadid today, but that was massive. And let me tell you, if you think there is no impact in your family or your own life. You are not restructuring companies. In Hadid days, honestly, my ex-wife could not go to the supermarket for months because she was being attacked by some woman. It was mostly expat women, <laughs> but she was, she was being attacked. The garbage was thrown in front of the door. And people say in Saudi Arabia that doesn't happen. Well, I can tell you, it does happen. And the people who threw garbage at my house door were Saudis. Okay? So it does happen. In Tasnih cases, some of the cars get scratched with somebody's key. Okay, what can you do? That happens. So that is, that is something be ready for. It doesn't happen very easily. Just to give you a short example of cuts, how significant. This is a, a Yambu plant, ours. Happened to be, unfortunately, way, way over uh, staff. The reduction was significant. Uh, the contractor about 50%, direct pay was about 26%. But let me tell you, we took also the yellow out. This slide was done a few months back. The total reduction in this plant was 46%. And the plant operates better and makes more product. So you can find that sometimes cutting extra manpower does not actually hurt your business. It actually improves it. And let me add one thing for those guys who's going to do it or try to do it. I hear people always saying, you cut the fat, but not like, don't touch the muscles. It's important. I said, obviously, you did not do a lamb kapsa. I know how many in the room have actually cooked a lamb kapsa. I'm, I love cooking. Okay? So I cook lamb kapsa. And lamb, we all know in the Gulf, is very fatty. And who cooked? You take a knife, and you try to cut the fat out. How many people actually cut the fat only and not little meat here or muscle there or something there? Anybody here did that? Clean cut? No fat, nothing, or just fat only? I don't see any hands up. So in reality, restructuring is ugly and dirty and clumsy. You're going to cut some, but the, best, the, the things we will do, it's the rule of the 80-20. You're going to achieve about 80%. There are going to be some errors here and there, and you have to accept it. That's just life. And you're going to move on. And the beauty of this is actually you realize that maybe you cut too much, you can always go back. So my advice, before I get to the next slide with consultants, when consultants tell you cut 20% or so, go for 30. Because it's always easier to add manpower than taking it again. An organization, once shaken, it's not so good to shake, keep shaking it all over the place. So it's better do a little bit over and then go back. That's no problem. The other fallacy is people tell you only fire the non-productive workforce. Keep all the good people. Well, I wish we can all do that, but in reality, 
when organization go through restructuring, a lot of people just cannot take the change. They get stressed. And some of those are good people. And you're going to lose them. That's a fact of life. And you wish not to. I'm not saying you go out of your way and just fire those people. But I want you to know reality in an change organization, some people, good people, you don't want to leave, they're going to leave. And believe me, the other message I would like to leave in this room, which I always preached in Sabic for many, many years, money doesn't keep people in the company. Don't tell me go and pay Ali, Joe, Muhammad increase of 20% or 30%. That's not going to do it. Some people are going to leave, regardless of what you do. So you might well accept it. Don't inflate your payroll. Make sure your payroll is reasonable. And just move on and make sure you keep the pipeline full. Hire, hire, bring people, get people on. That's important. So this is how the cut was done. And I hope somebody was seeing it, our uh, guys in the back. And they said, well, it looks decent because the cut, look how the line came. It's proportional in a way. We did not plan it proportional, but it came that way. If you should have your top, this is before, this is after. This number is around almost, used to be about 8,500 something. Now it's down to the 6,000, less than this number now. But you can see, your top guys should not be more than 0.1% of your workforce. The combine of your second and third line in your organization shouldn't be more than 1%, and so on. If you ask the McKinsey's or the BCG's or the strategy end of the world, they will tell you this number within the norm of the industry. If you have top heavy, then you have a problem. Because what the Americans say, you'll have all chiefs and no Indians. And that's not good. It's better to have less chiefs and more Indians. So that's, that's very important. So the next is you really, you really need to be sweating your assets. A lot of money can be got out, forget just the money you save from headcount reduction. A lot of money can be got by sweating your asset. And what I mean by that, improving reliability of your plants. And I used to have an old friend, Sabik, he left, I don't know if he's here today or not, Abdullah Rabia. Always used to go, always go for soft solutions. Don't change the hardware. Engineers always love to make a project and change hardware. That costs money. But soft change is really improving the people, training the people, bringing some people who are more knowledgeable in a process. More engineering, for example, to help in certain things. But your hardware solution should be your last. You should concentrate first on the software, and you do. And I'll show example of what I'm talking about. Yield is a huge improvement. If we can improve the yield of the cracker, you know, the snake cracker, only last year since it was built, we went over 100% of design. It was 103%, close the year. So if you can do that with the existing asset without adding anything, that's really money, huge money, worth a lot of things. So you should concentrate on these things, and that's, that's very important. Of course, procedure has to be in place, and you will be amazed how many companies, not only here, by the way, but even in the Western world, have procedure that 20 years old or things gone, equipment change, but never update the paperwork. So you need to be careful of that one. Significantly, you need to be. This is just a case in one of our plants. It's high-density polyethylene, HDPE. Anybody operate HDPE knows these plants are finicky. They're not some of the easiest plants. They operate under you know, high pressure and so on. And you can see the improvement of 7% in August 2015. And now it's even higher, so I didn't want to show the data for 16. I can't, we can't keep it. But it is important. This is money coming without doing any cost. So that's, that's very significant. Uh, again, happy to say that our uh, site in Jubail was recognized by Oil & Gas, which is a well-known publication, by the, be the best excellence program in manufacturing. So actually people from outside, not the Gulf, but actually <laughs> in oil and gas, which is a Houston-based, actually see this thing. So the next is really what you need to manage your boards and you need to manage your committees. I would rather have an active board who involved with me than a passive board. Some CEOs, some leaders will tell you, well, I want to do it, I don't want to be bothered. Well, that's not right. You need to have your board with you. 
not because taking blame or anything, but more heads is better than one. No matter how good you are in life, Einstein, if you will, it's always better to have some people around. Sometimes maybe you go too far or too little. You know, it depends. You know, I've seen boards in, uh, in my career and other places that you come to them with a plan, they'll tell, no, it's not enough. Because always boards, especially in Western countries, have that mentality where the management brings is kind of their conservative. So we have to push more. Sometimes you find boards seem less, but it's always push on the more, not the less side. You need, you, you as a CEO, you need to bring your management team with you. I don't mean bring them new, hire them with you. The best is you probably have a mixed team. You're going to have to hire. In my case, it happened to be mixed, both. People from out, people from win. But the most important is this management team is with you. They believe in the change. Because if those people don't believe in the change, they drag you down. And believe me, it is better to let go an executive, even hiring them two months only, and you feel bad, and you might look not so good because you made the wrong decision, but that's better to let somebody like that go rather than the damage they will do staying with you. So you just have to be safe and say, Khalas, enough is enough. Ma'assalam. Now we go to my favorites, banks and consultants. First of all, in any country, in any jurisdiction, debt takes priority over dividend. We like it or not, that's every loan agreement. Banks will not allow you to play with their money. You can be smart as you want, but the reality is you have, when you deal with the bank, you have to show them that you are one of them, that you care about their well-being, that actually you care about their money they gave you, and you have no intention of not paying it back. This is important. I hear people say, no, the bank, they just gave you the money, they're stuck with you, so what? Well, they can make your life miserable, believe me. They can really make your life miserable, and they drive you to bankruptcy if they want. Of course, that's their last solution. But please, care about the banks. Make sure they understand. They will help you. Once they see you are reasonable, they trust in you. For example, I know in the bank, when I first sit with them, I say, look, guys, I know how you keep your books. If I don't pay you interest, you're going to make a provision. And the rules, especially now coming with IFRS, if that thing's not paid, the whole loan of, like, let's say, $4 billion, and you didn't pay only like 40 million interest, you didn't pay it. The bank would be forced in their books to take a right off in 4 billion. That is painful for any bank on earth to take that. So you need to say, look, I know I'm not going to push you in the corner to do that thing. I will not stop paying interest. I will do, but you need to extend me, give me a grace period for the principal. I can't pay you half a billion next payment or 200 million next payment. Give me a a grace period. So we're going to push the payment a few months or a few years back. If the payment over three, five years, you're going to say, okay, guys, I do this, I pay, but it's going to be now 17 years. Most banks will be reasonable because the last thing they want is push you to the end. We have done crystal refinance, which was one of the most difficult I've seen in my financial career of over 20 years, which was 40 bilateral facility. You have basically 40 loans. And each loan is different, covenants and conditions and everything. One in default, one in not in default, one in this, one in that. So these 40 were combined in one syndicated loan. This is the most important. So that's done behind us, and the rest are coming in the way. Consultants. Look, a consultant is as good as the client. We client always love to blame consultants for our failures. That's always. When you say this, BCG were not good, strategy are not good, uh, old booze not good, or McKinsey not good. The reality is we are also guilty. I ran projects in my life when I was in operation. And any project guy in this room always know when the project has problems in budget or schedule, who do we blame? The contractor. We blame the contractor. I never been in a presentation, a late project, where the project team blames itself. It's always somebody. But the reality is, it's not black and white. The reality is we're both guilty in the same thing. So we have to be fair and honest and admit our things to get the other side to do their thing. Consultants are very good at analyzing and bringing you 
other people's experiences, best practices, things been done successful, things not successful. But consultants are very bad at execution. You cannot outsource the execution of your plan to the consultant. And believe me, I also seen that in some places. They wanted the consultant just to solve the problem and disappear, and they want to sit to watch him. Well, that doesn't work, my friends. The consultant give you things, but you have to do the hard work yourself. The other thing is don't over-rely on consultants. You know, like we always say in, in business, in our, when we first have in technical people, or we can give you a crutch, but if you get used to it too much, you'll, you know, what happens? You'll forget really how to walk, and you're gonna be walking on a stick. So, Try it if you, if you don't believe me. Try it for a few months, you'll see what happens. So these things, you have to be careful with these things. So we want to do it, but at the end, we have to do it ourselves. And consultant can bring good things, but also if you over rely on them and they become your crutch, you will have consultant in your company forever. And I know some companies in America or here, they have consultant forever. That's not good. Consultant should have a start date and end date. That's it, finished. You should not have so much and so on, because oh, again, I'm not against the consultant in this room, but the consultant, how do they make money? They have to keep consulting. So the more the project continues, the better it is for a consultant. So it's a no-brainer. So you have to, how many of you did a visibility study in a chemical plant project, and the guy who did your visibility study, I don't care which of the companies who have mentioned a name who do the feasibility studies, and he told you, don't do the project, the project is bad. I never heard it in 25 years in Saudi. Why? Because he cuts, you has cut on himself, he cuts his business. If he's gonna tell you don't do the project and the other don't do the project, what business left? So you have to be the judge of things yourself. You cannot leave it to that. So this is really what we brought all the team. We had to make sure the employees with us. You, as a leader of organization, you need. I went to uh, sites. Mr. Khafra went me, with me a few times also. You need to have town halls. You need to speak to the people. You know, they will ask you, are you going to cut headcounts? I say, yes. Yes. You can't hide these things. You can't lie to people. People will see it. So you be fair and say, look, we will... Let go some, we will take care of them. We're not going to throw them to the wolves. We're going to throw them in the street. We'll take care of them logically within the law and maybe more than the law. But that's the way it is. That's the way life is all about. I love you, but, you know, even with your kids. Sure, sometimes you have to tell your kids, hey, you need to work. Get out of the house. You know, that's, that's normal. So with that, I thank you all. I think I talked too much. The thing's given me here a warning, and I wish you all the best, and I hope I did not uh, upset anybody with this hard talk. So thank you. Thank you.